Well, hello everybody. Nice to see you, or well, not see you, but hear from you. Um, I just need to make sure that everything's working before we start. Um, just sending Vicky a quick message. <laughs> just, just in case it's not working, you know what these live streams are like. Um, and uh, we're going to have a really, really super uh, session this evening. I'm really, really looking forward to it. Um, I've done it a little bit differently this time um, because we are on YouTube rather than Zoom. Um, uh, hopefully it will work as well, but it just means that, you know, if we do have lots of people joining, then um, there's not a maximum, which happened last time. Um, oh, good. OK. Does that mean does that mean we're on? <laughs> oh, dear. Hang on. I always panic when we do these live things. Um, so yeah, it's really, really nice to see everybody. Uh, and what I'm going to be doing tonight is I'm going to be sharing three areas that are going to really, really um, help with your development and your realism. Um, when it's not a live draw along tonight, um, usually what I do in these sessions is I kind of share a bit of a presentation and talk about bits and pieces and everything. Um, but tonight I'm actually going to be on my drawing board and I'm going to be doing some demoing. Um, please, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, Vicky is on hand to, to help as well. Uh, so she will send me some questions and everything through for something that she can't answer. Um, but I am very, very um, passionate about helping other artists. Um, and the thing is that I think we all get really, really bogged down with the uh, with draw drawing should be really enjoyable. We should all absolutely love the process. And I think we do get a little bo bit bogged down uh, with details and what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. And I think um, what we forget is that there is always a process. There's always a way of getting from A to B. And what I found over the last few years from from teaching it, thousands and thousands of people to draw with colour pencils is that we all go through exactly the same process. Some go through really, really, really quickly. Some go through, you know, a lot slower. Um, some literally pick up the process as they're doing their second, third, fourth drawing. Some people, it might take a couple of years. It's very much dependent on your personality, your environment, you know, what's going on in your life. But we all follow the same process. And that's what I want to try and demo tonight is that process and give you some really, really great tips as to how you can uh, identify that you're going through the process so you can be really happy with the work that you're doing now and then start to work on uh, your drawings so that you can uh, um, uh, work on your skills and your techniques so that your drawings can become even better and that's what I want to work on today so we're going to be working on three areas values if if you know me you know my stuff you know my teaching um, it's all about the values um, details I want to talk to you about details, what you think details are, what I believe details are, and how we can make our realistic drawings look even more realistic so they can literally walk off the page. And then I want to talk to you about finishing, finishing your work. Um, it's a really, really important part of a drawing. And once you kind of get to the point where you start to really understand how important those little finishing touches are, your work can then elevate, your work can then go to a higher level, uh, your work seems better. And it's these tiny little, tiny little tweaks that really helps you move up that ladder. And that's what I want to help today with. Um, and I'm really, really excited because I've not done this kind of uh, kind of a session before where I'm actually demoing. Um, so I'm, I'm just really excited about this. And, uh, you know, fingers crossed, <laughs> fingers crossed it goes well. Um, I know, I know that what I'm about to show you is awesome. Um, but uh, I want you to ask any questions. So any questions you've got, please do pop them in the chat and I will try to answer them. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come off my view here um, and I'm going to go to my drawing board. 
So I'm just going to click this off here. And hopefully what you should see on the screen now is the, oh, just get something out of my eye, um, half, half a Labrador here. <laughs> half a Labrador. I'm going to get my little hat on as well, actually, just scooting around on my chair. Um, I have my light set up so that they're at the back of my drawing board. Um, and it just means that I don't get really uh, bad shadows everywhere. Um, but it also means that the lights tend to shine in my eyes. So I wear a visor um, because it stops the light. It, it means that I can see all of the values and everything. So what we're looking at here, and actually I'm just going to lighten it up just a touch. Um, in fact, no, I'm just going to check my screen and make sure my screen is... No, I think we're okay. So what we're looking at here is a piece that you hopefully will have seen on um, social media. I had this idea that I wanted to really show um, the difference between um, where many people are now and where many people want to be but don't know how to get to. This is not a session on don't do this but do this, okay? I think this, this side here is very acceptable. I think it's a nice drawing. It's well structured. All of the bits and pieces are in the right place. Um, and I think this is very much a, a part of the process that we all go through. I went through it. You know, all of my students have been through it. And like I say, it, there's no time scale on this. Some people are, are quite speedy. Some people are a little bit more, uh, you know, take a little bit more time. And hopefully what you can see on this particular uh, drawing here is that I have very much concentrated on details. OK, um, I'm just getting a pencil out here and then I can just show you. Uh, I'm just going to sharpen it. Hang on a second. Sorry if you hear a noise. Um, so I have very much concentrated on the details of the fur. So when we first start drawing, what we what we think about when we think about realism are loads of details. And I'd really, really like it if you just popped in the chat and I will have a quick look. Pop in the chat what you think details are. Um, you know, what do you when when somebody says to you, oh, gosh, that's really detailed or oh, you need more details in there. What does it mean to you that those details are? Uh, and I'd love it if you just pop it in the chat and we can just have a quick look. I'm just going to open my um, YouTube now, actually, and just see if I can um, if I can see your answers, um, because I think that's a really important part of all, what we're doing now is what your understanding is of a detail, um, you know, because. This is when I first started drawing, my understanding of a detail was, oh, I need to get all of the hairlines in. I need to get, you know, all of those tiny, tiny little bits in and all of the specks in the dog's nose. I need to get all of those in and I need to go crazy with all of those details. And as I've progressed and I've developed and I've kind of learned so much more, I've realised that that really isn't the case. It's really not the case. So I can see some answers coming in through here. Uh, details give substance, life to each work, fine lines, the bits that catch the eye. Uh, uh, so it looks like the reference photo, textures on the top, every single hair, values, shadows and highlights. Um, this is awesome. Thank you so much for this. Lots of fine lines for fur, shadows and highlights. Um, yeah, so we've getting some, getting lots and lots of great answers here. Really, really great answers. So we've got um, values, shadows, highlights, and we've also got a lot of lines for fur. And I think that is very much part of the process that we that we go through. And that's exactly what I thought when I started drawing. I need to get all of those fur lines in. I need to draw every single tiny line and bit of fur. And it's going to look really super realistic. Um, and actually, it does look realistic. But the, 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 the lines on the top, if you draw every single tiny little bit of fur, can actually look a little bit either over, overwhelming or particularly on a dog like this that is a, a smooth haired dog, and that's why I chose a black Labrador, it can make it look more textured. And this is what I'm seeing quite a lot when I'm doing my critiques. I'm seeing quite a lot smooth animals with lots of texture because we've drawn every single hair. Um, and you can see in this particular drawing that I've this side that I've done, we've got all of these hairlines. So I'm really, really concentrating 
on all of the little hairlines that are coming in. That is where I'm concentrating all of my focus. Get all of those hairlines in. It's going to look really, really realistic. But actually what it does is it tends to make the dog look a little bit more textured. So it's not necessarily a, a really smooth haired dog. And there are little things that you can do to help that with the details. Um, oh, I'm just going to turn that off. Hang on, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, there are little things that you can do. And it's more about smoothing. It's more about thinking about where the details are really, really important. And with a portrait like this, where it's a, a head and sort of like bit of a neck, the focus point is very much around the eye area. So we will put tons of details in the eyes. We put loads of details around the eyes. Um, we'd, we'd bring details in kind of in between the eyes um, and down kind of onto the cheeks. And then there are areas where actually it's quite nice not to have a load of detail because the more lines we've got in here, the more likely our eye is drawn to where the, where the texture is. Um, and actually it's quite nice to have areas that are really nice and soft. So what we can do is we can use our pencils to soften part of these areas and make it look less textured. Uh, textured. So if we come into the top of the head up here, actually this is really quite nice and soft and it would be quite nice to have this so that it's a little bit smoother looking. We've still got this lovely highlight coming through, um, but we don't have as much of that texture. And this is where your light over dark comes in. I'm working on pastel matte here and I've got a couple of pencils. I've got my Polychromos Warm Grey 2 and I've got a Pablo Light Grey. Um, it's, one's a cooler grey and one's a warmer grey. Both are really, it looks like chopsticks. Um, <laughs> uh, both are really, really great for smoothing. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic technique to use on pastel mat is using a darker colour, so your black, um, maybe like a dark blue, a dark red, something like that. And then your lighter colours over the top that end up being able to smooth it. So you can put your details in and your texture and your lines and everything. And then you can just come in over the top and just lightly bring in your pencil marks. Just very, very, very gently. I'm not pressing hard here at all. Just very gently bring in the pencil over the top. And what that does is you don't lose the texture as such, but it just softens everything. It just makes everything just that little bit softer and smoother. And that's what we're wanting with a smooth haired dog. We're wanting it to look nice and smooth. We're wanting it to look like the shine's going up and, you know, and it's smoothing. Um, and this is a really, really nice way of working is bringing the, the dark in and then bringing the light over the top. We can then bring the, 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 the black or the blue back in and we can start to build up those values again and get those nice and dark in there. Um, so I'm just going to I'm just going to share the other side and then we can really hopefully see um, the difference and I can I can point out the differences. So this is the other side all drawn on one piece of paper. So it wasn't a, when I shared it, it wasn't, you know, I'd done two and then I put half and half together. So it's all done on one side of paper. And hopefully you can see that we've got we have got some really lovely fur details in here, really nice fur details in here but it's a little bit softer, a little bit denser. What I've tried to do is actually build my layers, concentrate on the values rather than the hairlines. Although there are a few little lines in there, it, the whole idea is it's much smoother um, and, and plusher fur. You know, we're looking at fur that is short, um, but it's soft and it's very, very dense. So you, you, when you look at a Labrador, you don't really see all of those hairs. Now, again, I'm not saying this is wrong and this is right. I wanted to make a, a little bit of an extreme. I, I don't think either of them are, are extreme, to be, to be honest. But I wanted to make a little bit of an extreme so that I could really point out how um, you can create realism without having to put every single tiny little hair in and actually concentrate far more on uh, areas that I feel are... Uh, and, and as I've developed my work, I know it is true, um, really concentrating on those values. When it comes to values, I think that can be really confusing as well. 
I know many, uh, many people who teach art, uh, realistic art in any kind of medium will talk about values. You need to get your values right. You need to get your darks really dark. You need to get your lights really light. Um, you know, we, we kind of know that and it's sort of drummed into us. And sometimes, you know, you sit there and you think, what's that actually mean? You know, when you say you need to get your darks really light and your lights really light, what does that mean? Because these darks are dark and these lights are light. So how, how come this, you know, how come I could push this to look a little bit more sort of smoother and a little bit more, you know, uh, realistic um, when, when I've got my darks dark and my lights light? And actually, it goes a lot further than that. It's, it's a lot more involved, really. And for me, I, I think we have to go through this process of drawing all of the lines in, all of the fur lines, concentrating on that, then realising that, that values are really important. So making sure that your values kind of go in and your darks are dark and your lights are light. And then you go one step further and you go, oh, hang on a second. There are a lot more values in, a, in an animal, in a picture, in a human, in a flower, in a whatever. There are a lot more values in there, but they're all incredibly subtle. They're not just really dark darks and they're not just really light lights. There are some really tiny, subtle shifts in the dark and the light as we go through the hair. And actually, if we start to concentrate on those little subtle shifts, they then become the details. Um, and this was kind of a bit of a light bulb moment for me because it meant that I didn't have to draw all, every single tiny little hair or at least... I didn't have to have a portrait that was finished showing every single tiny little bit of hair. I could actually show a drawing that looked at and portrayed all of the contours on an animal. It portrayed the shine, it portrayed the shadows. Um, and we also got that lovely quality of the fur. So we got the lovely softness uh, in the fur and everything. Um, and that was by just concentrating on all of these little tiny shifts in values. So up here, you know, we've got a little light area here, uh, dark area coming through here. We could make that a little bit softer, really. Um, coming up here, you've got this little tiny bit of light here before you go into these little soft tufts of hair coming through here. Uh, this little bit of light in here as well. Um, the tiny bits of dark coming through onto the sort of the muzzly area down here, which which create structure, which show us the you know the, the the contours of the dog's face without having to put lots and lots of lines in and and create all of the the lines and everything. Again, I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong, um, but I think a lot of people want to refine their pieces um, and don't actually realize that they, that they can do and also they don't realize that it's a process that we're going through so um that was a big light bulb moment for me understanding that the details aren't the fur lines the details are actually all of the tiny shifts in value you can have a uh, a drawing with no fur lines in at all um and it looked really realistic and that's because the values do all of the work. And it's the same with colour. You know, colour isn't important either. Colour, details, not important for realism. Um, it's all about the, the values. It's all about how we structure, uh, you know, the, the, the lights and the dark so that we can actually get that, that beautiful structure of the dog's face. Um, Okay, so I've got a bit of a question here from Vicky. Uh, Greys to blend versus colourless blender. So I've got a colourless blender here as well. And will techniques change from film or pastel matte? Did you lay dark down first? Okay, so all great questions. So this is a colourless blender here. I've got a bit of orange on the, on the back of that. Um, colourless blender is actually, uh, this is a luminance colourless blender. So this is sort of quite a waxy uh, pencil. I prefer to use the harder, drier pencils on pastel matte. You can, of course, use a colourless blender. Um, i just bring a little bit up into the top there. Uh, you, I would say use it very, very lightly and it's just going to sort of smush your colours together. Personally, I prefer to use an actual pencil um, and that's purely because of how the pigment goes, not the pigment, but how the, um, the actual... Um, 
well, it is pigment. This one's colourless, so it's not really pigment, but it's the, the waxy sort of residue lays down. I prefer a pencil over the, the colourless blender. However, if you're using a hot press paper, the colourless blender is probably going to work really well. So it very much is uh, surface dependent. Um, and it's not necessarily greys to blend. Uh, this one is a black dog with blue undertones. So greys actually work incredibly well. Um, you could also use pinks. So I, I like to use my Pablos quite a lot. So I have the um, uh, granite rose here, uh, Pablo. Um, and I could use this in my dog as well if I wanted to. This is a, another really, really great pencil for blending. I would use this to blend browns and oranges. Um, just because it's sort of like that, that, that a better hue for blending that sort of colour. With the blacks and the blues, greys are a really good, um, a really good idea. Um, another question from Vicky, no, no embossing tool. I don't ever use embossing on pastel mat. Um, I'm not saying you can't, that's my, just purely my own experience. I can't bear embossing on pastel mat. <laughs> It makes the surface go, I'm not saying I can't bear other people's work, I can't bear my work. Um, it makes the surface go really weird. Um, and you'll know if you've had, if you've had pastel mat, you'll know if you've got a scratch on it. It's really tricky to kind of cover that scratch up. And I know embossing, we want to kind of make marks in there, but it kind of disturbs the surface around the, 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 the indented mark. And I don't like it at all. Um, so I just use my pencils. Pastel mats are a fantastic surface to be able to get lights over dark. This was all done uh, just with, with kind of my pencil marks in here. Actually, this is, this is really nice. I really actually really, really like what I've done here. Um, I have to say for me, if I'm creating a portrait, this side is, is kind of the where I would go. I'd probably push my lights a little bit more. Um, and I've maybe put a few more layers on here. This was done for sort of like a demoing purpose. Um, you know, I probably spend a little bit more time on it. Um, but uh, this is the side that I this is the side that I would bring my portraits to. Really, really concentrating on the contours of the face and trying to get that quality of the fur. You can see. I think the ears are a really good uh show a really good difference you know the really really dark areas that they, they they look silky smooth whereas this one sort of looks a little bit more probably like he's been swimming something like that um okay i've got another question from vicky where it says will you use zest it <laughs> no <laughs> again um anybody who knows my teaching knows that i am highly uh i don't know whether i'm a, but i i'm really affected by zest it um it it's it's not a nice thing to use at all you if you're okay with it you use it i can't use it at all it brings on the most dreadful migraines that actually stop me from i can't speak i lose my i lose my speech um and almost like a little bit of uh, as if i've had a stroke to be honest it was quite terrifying when i used it a long time ago i think it was 2016 when i first started and i was like oh i can't have can't have it in my house um, it's the most awful stuff. So no, I don't use any mineral spirits at all in my work. Um, I only use blending. It's just it's just coloured pencils on top of coloured pencil, on top of coloured pencil, on top of coloured pencil. And that's how I teach. I don't teach with any uh, mineral spirits or anything like that. I don't say it's wrong. I, there's nothing, there's no wrong and there's no right. Um, you know, some people do teach with it. I don't. I, I much prefer just my pure pencils and, and uh, you know, and I really like the results that I get. So when we talk about values, we're talking about everything, not just the really dark areas and the really light areas, but everything. We're talking about how we can really get something to look like it's popping out of the paper, like it's, like it's about to step out in front of you. Um, and that is how uh, kind of concentrating on those little tiny areas makes a massive difference. What else makes a massive difference is when you make your darks really dark um, and your lights, if your lights need to be really light, make them really light. Uh, sometimes we make them too light, particularly in a shiny dog like this. A lot of the time um, we see a highlight as being white. And that's kind of what I've tried to show on this side here. Um, you know, our brain sees light and goes white. It's white. It's white. Let's just put white in. <laughs> and that's why, we, you know, so many of us struggle when we're drawing white, white animals. Um, you know, we go, well, it's white. It's just white. 
<laughs> so I just need to get white on. Um, and actually, if we really look into it, and it's a half decent photo, we'll find that there's a huge amount of colour in there, a huge amount of values that go in there. And actually, white is made up of, you know, all of the colours that are surrounding that particular subject uh, that's reflected in its fur. And the same with a, you know, with a black dog as well. But a lot of the time, um, when we're drawing a shiny black dog, the highlights become too light. Um, and when the highlights become too light, then the values tend to become too light as well because we're, we're sort of adjusting everything. We're pulling everything into that lighter direction. So everything becomes a little bit lighter. Um, and it's really, really, I'm going to do another one of these purely on values. So showing one that where the values are, are, are way off and one where I feel the values are, are where I'd want to, to have them. Um, but we can see definitely in here uh, where I've got the really, really dark darks and where we don't need to put any kind of detail. When I first started drawing, I would get my photograph and I would lighten it up. So in, so I'd get like an area in here where it's really dark or really dark in here. And I would lighten my photograph up so that I could see all of the details in the shadow. And I would draw all of those details in from the lighter photograph. Um, and actually, again, you know, these big light bulb moments started going off and I was like, why? What, why am I doing that? When actually, this is beautiful. This is amazing. You know, when we're looking at something, we don't see all of the information in the shadow. We see it a really, really nice, dark, rich shadow. Um, and this is what we mean by make your darks really nice and dark. So th this one, uh, let me see if I can find the pencil that I used for that. Um, I don't know whether I've got it to hand. It's my uh, Derwent drawing, ivory black. It's quite little, so it's um, it keeps on hiding. Um, no, I can't find it. Um, it's um, oh here it is, here it is, here it is. Um, if you're looking for a really, really, really black black, this is the most awesome pencil. This is the Derwent drawing, um, ivory black. Well used. <laughs> It's really big and fat. So if I put it next to my polychromos black, you can see the difference there. It's a, it's a fat one, it's got a fat core and it's really, really soft. They're highly light fast. I think they come in about a set of 24 colors, very sort of muted, natural colors. Um, and the this is the, the blackest of blacks. And this is what I've used in here. And all I've done is I've just come in and I've literally used a little bit of pressure, not, not like tons of pressure, but it's got the most amazing coverage and it's black, it's really, really black. And you know what? You could use this without any other layer underneath it. <laughs> I know we say black, but you've got to put all of the colors in the black. You, you can just use this on its own and it is absolutely amazing. You can use this on pastel mat, you can use it on drafting film, you can use it on uh, your hot press paper. It's an absolutely fantastic pencil. But quick tip, only use a handheld sharpener for these pencils. The, the, the cores are very soft. If you put it into an electric pencil sharpener, you, you're likely to cause all sorts of problems and it will break. So I only use my little handheld, little tiny, let me see if I can find it actually. Uh, where is it? Oh, that's gone missing as well. But I only use a little tiny, tiny little silver pencil sharpener for that. Um, it doesn't make a, a massively sharp point and it blunts very quickly. Uh, but it's a fantastic pencil to get your darks really, really nice and dark. And you then don't need to add any detail. So you can see on this side here, this is really sort of quite smooth. You might want to put a little bit more detail into this area here. So we might want to go into here and just bring a little bit more in. Uh, in the form of sort of just, you know, sort of slight texture around the eye area, around that sort of mask area. But around here, we don't really need any of those sort of fur lines in there. We want it to blend quite nicely. I've actually got a little bit, I think a little bit of pink in here. Um, and I've also got a little bit of orange as well. So I like to use uh, bright colors. So I just brought a little bit of pink into here. And then I think I've also got a little bit of, um, which one did I use? I think it was this one. Um, just a little bit of I think it's dark cadmium orange in there too. I'll show you that in a second. Um, and um, 
all we need to do is then co just concentrate on the values. And you can see that we go sort of from light and then it just blends nicely. We're thinking about a nice graduation from the light through to the dark. Anywhere where we've got a really strong light and dark gives contrast. Um, so this is nice here. This is contrasty. We can really see the structure of the face and everything in here. Um, if we don't want somebody to look at something, so if we don't want somebody to look down here, so say there's an area of fur down here and you're not quite sure what's going on with it and you're a bit like, I don't really know what that is. Um, it's kind of a bit, I've got a bit of a rubbish photo and I don't really know what this bit is down here. If you keep this area down here soft, blended, no strong uh, contrast, so no, you know, really strong uh, lights against a strong dark, people's eyes are not going to be drawn down here. So you'll see, Pete, you, I, if I, when I look at this picture, I'm drawn more to this side here, down here, because of the texture, because we've got sort of uh, lighter areas with the dark. Whereas this side, it's much more smoother, it's much more muted. And we want people to focus their attention up here. This is where we want them to look. Um, you know, obviously you're going to have a bit of a look around the portrait, but this is where people are going to be looking. If they're going, oh, what's this down here? Because you've got some really strong contrast in there. That can be a, that can be a, real, um, a real problem, particularly if you've got uh, more than a head and shoulders and maybe you've got sort of like a body in there and you've got like a, you know, when you get those photos where it's lying down and it's got a weird leg <laughs> hanging out of the side and you're like, well, oh, how am I supposed to, you know, portray that? And if you portray it so it's nice and sort of faded, a little bit less is more, uh, nicely blended and not a lot of contrast, you, you people aren't going to notice it. Um, and that's, you know, some really nice little tricks and everything that you can fit into your, um, into your work. Um, how do I get the black black? Down here, this is literally all I used. Um, literally all I used was this, the drawing black. In here, I have used blues. In here, I have used blues. And I used a couple of blues. Um, I used the Indanthrin blue, which is number 247, which is sort of like more of a royally blue. And the dark indigo, which is a 157. Um, so I used these with my polychromos black just to get a little bit of something underneath there. I don't just want to use, I just, I don't just want to use greys and blacks because that's, a bit boring. I want to lift it a little bit and that's why I start to bring a little bit of colour in. I'm going to go into that in a second when I talk about the finishing. Um, so when you're when you're adding your, uh, your shadows, uh, the really dark shadows, it really is important to go nice and dark and don't worry about bringing any details in there at all. I think it's lovely to have these areas of just almost flat colour um, the lovely thing with the pastel mat is that you can then get your little light areas coming in over the top. So this is the Pablo light grey and I can bring these lovely little sort of wisps through and it sits really, really nicely on top of that dark, dark black in there. Um, I can actually make it quite light if I want to. It, well, I'd need to sharpen my pencil a bit, but I can make it quite light. I can bring a white in there. Um, I then need to go in and I just need to sort of tweak little areas so I could use like a little bit of a cotton bud. I've got two types of cotton buds. I have, oops, so I have the normal cotton bud. These are just Johnson's cotton buds. Um, they're a bit fluffy, but they're, they're fine. Um, and I have these other, I don't know what make these are, this was just off of Amazon. And these have got, you can see they've got like a little pointy end. I think they're probably for cleaning jewellery and all of that kind of stuff. These are really great. These little pointy ones are really great for getting into tiny little areas. And I can just come into here and I can just sort of, just gently smudge, just a tiny little bit. You've got to use really light pressure because it will take will take the, the colour off the, um, you can see there, it'll take the colour off the surface. But you can just sort of smudge little areas like that. So these are little tools that you can use, work really, really well with, particularly with pastel mat. Um, and, um, you know, don't worry too much about trying to put details into dark areas like this because you just don't need it. Keep all of that gorgeous detail front and centre, around the eye area, you know, spend all of that time, um, you know, on the eyes, spend all of that time kind of uh, on the nose area, you know, really putting all of that fantastic detail in. I feel that with eyes and noses, you can, you can really copy a photograph. You know, you can look at a photograph and you can copy exactly what's on the photograph into your drawing. 
when it comes to fur, that's a really big job to copy a photograph exactly. It's a, it's a really, really big job and it's a bit boring. <laughs> I mean, I, lo I love the process of drawing, but I don't wanna sit there and make sure that every single hair is the same as a photograph. So that's where I take the look and the feel, the softness of the fur. I really look at the structure of the animal um, and make sure that everything's in the right places, that the values are correct, and then the fur can just sort of sit within that and it, and it just works really, really nicely. Um, Short-haired dogs, you kind of have to be very careful about, obviously, the, um, the fur direction. Short-haired dogs, horses, really, really careful about fur direction. And that's another area of these details that is incredibly important. So we've ascertained that details actually mean the subtle changes in value, but they also mean our pencil strokes. Which way do our pencil strokes go? And not necessarily so that we can see the pencil strokes, because we kind of talked about that and said they're not really that important. If you've got a photograph where you've got an animal that... Um, uh, well, you've got a photograph and you can't actually see the the hair direction and it's all a bit fuzzy and blurred. Don't try and put the fur details in. Just go with what you can look at. Try and put flat colour down and just have the tiny little subtle changes. So, you know, tiny little changes in value in here and here and here. But try not to bring all of that detail in. You can see with this one that we can see, you know, a little bit of the pencil strokes in here. And when I've been putting my um, uh, layers in, my pencils have been following the direction of the fur. So I'm coming upwards here. I then come a little bit on a slightly different angle when I'm coming off the eye area here. When I'm coming on the nose, the muzzles are, are really, they're, they're quite a challenging area to draw, but I've got hairs that come off this way. I've then got an area that's sort of more flat and coming out towards us. So I tend not to bring any kind of detail in there, um, any kind of hair detail in there. It tends to just be more shading than anything else. Uh, then when we come onto the top of the head, we're kind of coming around this way. We've then got a bit of a dip. So I'm gonna, uh, my pencil marks, even if I don't make a fur mark, my pencil's still going to go in that little dip, it, almost as if I'm drawing on the dog's face. That's kind of what it what it all stems down to. It, it's like I, my pencil marks follow the structure of the face. So I'm coming round, I'm going down, I'm coming around, I'm going around. And if you can think of really concentrating on the sh on the shapes that your pencils are making, you know, so it's not just straight lines, straight lines. There's a beautiful curve to it. If you can start to really get a feeling for your pencils, um, you know, how it how it sort of glides onto the surface. Um, dexterity in your pressure is so important. If you struggle with your pressure, it's really good to practice pressure bars. Um, you know, a pressure bar is, is where, um, let's just put it on this piece of paper here, actually. I'll just take the, uh, I'll take this blue because it's quite a pretty colour. Uh, so a pressure bar, uh, we're going to keep our pencil on the surface of the paper. We're going to start off really, really nice and light. The, 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 paper, the, the pencil is not coming off the paper. We're just going to start to increase the pressure a little bit. Pencil has not left the paper. We're going to increase the pressure a little bit more. Not, it, it's not left the paper. When I start to increase more pressure, I've got a feeling now in my hand that I, I need to move my fingers down the pencil more. So I'm coming off the paper, I'm moving the, my, my fingers down the pencil so I've got a better grip on it so I can then start to actually put more pressure on. More pressure on, more pressure on, more pressure on, more pressure on. Got lighter and lighter and lighter. So you get to a point where, you know, it's much lighter. When you're drawing really lightly, we tend to hold the pencil back more. So you've got less leverage, you've got less ability to put all of that pressure on your pencil. So, you know, we can go really nice and lightly. Even if I try to add more pressure, it's much more uncomfortable and you kind of have to, you know, do that. If you're working on a really light area, it's much better to have your pencil back here and then you can just gently bring that pressure in. It's a, it's a really good idea to have all of this pressure in your toolkit. 
so that you can uh, you can when you're starting to work on for, on fur, you can start to kind of bring a little bit of fur in. You can go, oh, I want it a little bit darker there. Oh, I just want it a little bit lighter there. I want it a little bit darker there, so that you can really, really um, bring out all of this pressure um, in in just all in one go. You know, and, and again, that's a really nice way of laying down your initial layers so that you can bring some of those, uh, the idea of the um, the structure of the animal that you're drawing into the drawing right from the beginning. So your first initial layers actually will have lots and lots of different little pressure points in it. Um, OK, how do you know light fastness of pencils? So the, how you would know the light fastness of your pencils is down to the manufacturer's uh, information. So I know that, um, let's get, let me just get a couple of pencils here. So this one and this one. So I know that a Caran d'Ache Luminance, all 100 of their pencils, is it 100? I think it's 100. All 100 of their luminance range are highly light fast. Every single pencil is highly light fast, uh, whether it's a, um, a pale purple, a pale pink, a pale blue, uh, right through to all of the greens and the blues. They are all highly light fast and it's why they cost an awful lot of money. Um, the other pencils that are all highly light fast are the Derwent Light Fast. The, 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 uh, yeah, the answer's in the name there. <laughs> The Derwent Light Fast pencils, they are all highly light fast. They call them 100% light fast, but, you know, there are some things that you also need to do. Um, the Derwent Light Fast pencils come with an LF1, a light fast one, or an LF2. But the light, the LF2 are sort of slightly less light fast, and they're the, they're the more uh, sort of brighter colours. Um, but, but all of their range of 100 colours are highly light fast as well. Now... What you've got to try and remember is that if you don't look after your drawings and you don't frame them and correctly and you don't um, you don't situate them, you don't hang them correctly, uh, any kind of a painting is going to be, you know, is going to be subjected to, um, you know, sunlight. So, you, you know, you could put any kind of painting in bright sunlight and, and there's going to be some kind of a, um, you know, a, a degeneration of colour. So you've got to be really careful about where you hang stuff. Is also, for my work, whenever I frame any of my work, it's always framed using UV protective gl uh, glass. Um, and that then stops it's about 95% of the harmful UV rays getting through, which are going to then damage the, uh, the pigment. Um, and then make sure that you don't hang your... Uh, your work in direct sunlight. Now, the the um, the pencils like the Polychromos um, here. I've got two here, uh, an orange and a pink. The majority of these pencils are light fast. These have got a star rating on them. Um, and you can see here this the pink has got a two star, and the orange has got a three star. So the three star is the best, is highly light fast. The two star is good, um, you know, still pretty light fast. Again, um, all of the tests have been done on single colors, just single sort of layers of color and not kind of, you know, within uh, a, a portrait. So for me, I tend to use pencils that are good light fastness. Um, some pencils I might use as a blending tool rather than an actual color, and then I'm not bothered about uh, light fastness on that because I'm kind of using it to blend stuff rather than add color. Um, but all of the manufacturers, the, the, the artist quality pencils do have light fastness ratings and you can find those, uh, you know, on the manufacturer's websites. Um, do pencils smudge on pastel mat? Yeah, they do. Uh, let's just have a little play around with that now. So I'm going to have a look at this top bit up here um, and I'm just going to use my uh, cotton bud. Let's roll my sleeve up a little bit um, and I'm just going to Hopefully you can see that. You see that's nicely smudged in there. Um, because it's an abrasive surface, um, you know, it's got this sort of uh, lovely sort of velvety quality to it. And they're hard and dry pencils that I've laid down on the top of it. The hard, dry pencils become like this movable dust, if you like, and you can just move them around. Um, and it's and that's why I like to use the Polychromos and the Pablos first in those layers, because you can just move them all around. So if I come into the ear area here and I can just gently, gently bring that little cotton bud on there, 
we can just smudge out all of that colour. I'm using very light pressure. Um, so I can do this with a little cotton bud. I could do it with a little paintbrush. So this is just a, a little soft, doesn't really matter what it is. This is a filbert zero. It doesn't really matter what it is, but it's just a nice little soft. And you can kind of just brush a little bit on that. It does brush the pigment away, um, but you can soften edges. And again, I'm going to come to that very quickly in a minute about the finishing. Um, can you apply these techniques to bird feathers too, like Shani? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think with bird feathers, and this is one of the reasons why I don't draw many birds, because I, I my brain likes fur because I can make it up. With bird feathers, they're very symmetrical. They're, you've got to get the shapes correct. You've got to get them all laying, you know, properly. You've got to get all of the angles and everything correct. And that is more, I find birds more technical than, than fur because I can make the fur up as I go along. Um, and that's what you've just got to be careful about with feathers is using all of this, these techniques, you know, darks, lights, all of that kind of thing. But you do have to be careful with the structure. Uh, what pencils work well together? All of them work well together and it's a very much a personal preference. I love my polychromos um, and my pablos generally first, unless I'm drawing a person. <laughs> and then I tend to use luminance first, um, just because, again, because of the lay down, because of the texture that I'm drawing. Um, the light fast pencils I don't use a huge amount of and I tend to use them for colour only. So we have that lovely um, purpley colour. The, um, the heather here. So this is a really, really nice colour to go in with like your oranges and stuff like that. And I tend to use my light fast pencils for colour only rather than how they work. So I, I, they don't work for me the same as my other pencils do. So I like my um, polychromos and pablos generally down first, but just personal preference. There is no rule about it. Um, and then I can use like a little bit of um, my uh, my luminance on the top. I don't think I used any luminance on this one. Uh, it's all it's all polychromos and a bit of Pablo on this one. Um, I, I tend to only use polychromos in eyes. Um, and that's because of the lovely quality that polychromos have. They're slightly well quite a lot less opaque than some of those other softer pencils so you don't get as much as the pigment down and you tend to be able to see um, the colours through the layers and I find that a really beautiful quality for drawing eyes. Um, how do you stop it becoming muddy and overworked? Muddy comes from mixing colours that don't work well together so if you're finding that your colours are becoming muddy it's generally because you're using colours that um, uh, that they just don't go nicely together. It's a really good idea to think about looking at your colour wheel and thinking about how your complementary colours, split complementary, triadic colours all work nicely together. And that's why in this one I've brought a little bit of orange into him as well. Uh, so I brought a little bit of orange into here just as a glaze. Orange and blue are opposites on the colour wheel, so they work really nicely together. I just bring a little tiny bit of a glaze in here. It just adds a little bit of a warm, a warmth to the black fur, uh, which works really, really nicely. And the same again, bringing a little bit of pink. Um, I tend to use these bright colours in my black animals because it just brings out uh, that just that gorgeous depth and uh, and richness. Um, and just you know, you can't see it. You can't, you, you're not going to go, oh, that dog's got pink fur. It just adds to the whole layering. So just be very careful about the colours you're using. If you're working on orange animals, brownie orangey animals, use your purples in the shadows. Um, you know, we tend to, what, hap what tends to happen is we look at something and we go, oh, that's got a shadow on it. I'll use grey. Of course, when you use grey into a shadow, it just comes muddy and, and yucky and, and it's not nice. So we're going to work, go on to talking about finishing. And um, when I talk about finishing, um, I'm talking about adding these extra little bits of colour just to sort of uh, boost the vibrancy of the fur that we've already got down. Um, and also how we finish our edges and the bottom area here. So uh, many times I'll see absolutely beautifully drawn portraits. And then what we've got at the top is we've got sort of this. We've got, I don't know whether you can see that, we've just, we've just got pencil marks and pencil marks around the edge of the ear, just pencil marks, they're coming off and it's just not well finished. 
and having something that's not beautifully finished around the edges it detracts from all of the work that you've done within the rest of the portrait um so for me it's really really important to understand how we can get these lovely soft edges um onto something like this so it doesn't look like they're pencil marks it really does look like it's fur so if we come onto the top area here in fact um, i might just move down to this bit here actually i might just zoom in a little bit actually let's just have a look Okay, we can see we can see even better there now. So if I look on this side here, you can see some of these sort of like strong, quite strong pencil marks coming through here. Let's just exaggerate those a little bit. So we've got these bits of fur coming off. And it all looks a bit pencil-y. Um, and actually what we want to do is we just want to really soften these off. Um, and I, again, will use something like a bit of a, a cotton bud. So I might use the cotton bud that's one of these little pointy ones. Um, and I'll just come in and just, you can see how they smudge really nicely. So just smudge those out so they're nice and soft. Always thinking about the quality of the fur, how the, um, the, the portrait is actually connecting with the paper behind it because it's all, it's all one. You know, the, the paper behind it is very much part of the portrait. I can then get my kneadable eraser. So I use the Faber-Castell kneadable erasers. I tend to use the whole thing. I'm an all, all or nothing kind of a person. Um, I don't t take little tiny bits off. I use the whole thing and I use it. Um, this is a, a, a relatively new one, um, fresh this week. And I'll just kind of put it into some kind of a shape, like a dolphin shape. <laughs> you can have any shape you like. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just come into the edges and just sort of um, dab the ends of these little areas here, just so that these sort of disappear into the paper. Um, and then they become a little bit more tapered and they just connect with the background a little bit more rather than being these very strong lines coming off the edge. Um, finishing your portrait is so, so, so important. You can see here as well, I've put a little bit of these, I don't know whether you can see that right on the corner, a um, little bit of slice tool on there. <laughs> I did that to show that, yeah, no, don't do that. <laughs> don't use your slice tool on something like this. Um, uh, slice tool is amazing. It's a fantastic tool. Um, I love my slice tool. This is my slice tool here, uh, manual pen cutter. I tend to not use this on pastel mat. I'm working on pastel mat on this. I don't tend to use this on pastel mat. We don't need to. I put it in here as well. You can see I've put some like little scratchy marks in there as well. And they do end up looking a little bit like scratches. Um, and I think sometimes what happens is we get really frustrated. <laughs> it's like, I just want to get the white hairs in. So I'm just going to use my slice tool. I'm just going to scratch it all in. And then it, they end up looking like scratches. So if you're going to use a slice tool, be very intentional about where you're putting the marks and big tip, always have like a bit of a layer of waxy pencil down and then your slice marks will tend to come out a lot better. But remember, you don't need to use the slice tool on pastel mat because you've got the ability to get light over dark in there and you just don't need it at all. Um, you know, sometimes you might want to sort of go, oh, you yeah, know, maybe some stitching in a collar or something like that. Um, but yeah, don't don't use the slice tool. <laughs> use your pencils. Um, slice tool is a, is a tool, um, but my feeling is that uh, it should never um, be in place of good pencil work. So finishing is really important, making sure that you've got that lovely softness around your animal, that there's a connect or, the, you know, whatever subject you're drawing. There's a real connection um, with your portrait that you've drawn and the surface behind it. The other thing that we don't want um, particularly, well, I'm saying we don't want, uh, it's actually very much a, uh, a style thing. Just be really careful about strong lines around your portrait. Um, you can see down here, we've got a little bit of dark coming down, then we've got a little bit of light. Um, on the top of the head here, it's the, 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 the fur is tending to just sort of sweep off. Ideally, what we want in anything is either a lost edge or a found edge. A lost edge is where um, part of the subject kind of just bleeds off and you have the similar colour from the background to the actual subject and it just sort of bleeds off. You'll find that in, in very light colored animals. If you do white on white, 
you'll get those lost edges. If you do black on black, you'll get those lost edges. A found edge is more sort of like this, where you've got this really lovely strong shadow. This is a found edge here, lovely strong shadow down here. Um, I did a Fjord Foal, um, very pale, I think it was like a Palomino, very, very pale little uh, foal. And down one side of its, of its shoulder, there was a really big, strong, dark blue shadow. And it was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. I've got, um, actually, I've got another idea of a, um, a found edge as well. Let me just see if I've got this in here. Um, that lovely uh, dog that I drew. Oh, I don't think I can find it, actually. I'll see if I can find it. Uh, that was a really, really nice um, example of a found edge where you're putting a very, very strong shadow in and it does look really, really nice. Um, it was a Neapolitan Mastiff. Where is it? Gosh, you know, when you go through your phone and you find all of these, <laughs> there's like millions of pictures. Um, the Neapolitan Mastiff that I did, it's, it's definitely on my uh, social media uh, if I can't find it. And you can have a look at that and just have a look at the um, that found edge. Oh, I found her. Hold on. Here we go. So it's on my phone, but so it's quite dark. <laughs> but can you see this big, strong uh, shadow in there down here? That's a that's a really nice example of a found edge. And then we've actually got these sort of lost edges on the top where the head just sort of um, fades off at the top. Um, and it's really nice to bring that kind of uh, element into your work because then what happens is it, it elevates your um, it elevates your work, really elevates your work. Um, OK, how do we keep paper clean? So with me, with with pastel mats, um, how I keep I am not a. a I'm not going to say I'm not a clean person. I'm a very clean person, but I'm not a very tidy person. My studio always has dogs in um, and, and a cat. <laughs> There's always dust on my drawing board. Uh, basically, what I do, and I use white pastel mat a lot, what I do is I take my kneadable eraser and I every sort of every time I finish working on a drawing, I will come round with my kneadable eraser and I will just dab off all of the pencil dust. The other thing that how I work is I work with a piece of glassine under my hand. So glassine paper is a little bit like um, uh, wax, waxy paper. Don't use a waxy paper because it will pick your uh, pigment off. Um, but it's sort of like a smooth paper. It comes in between the sheets of pastel mat. It's a really great one to just put under your hand. Um, and the other thing is when I draw, my wrist doesn't move. So I'm not moving my hand around like this. My, my fingers move instead and I think that really helps with keeping everything clean as well um, and just every time you walk away from your work cover it up especially if you've got animals it's, it's a flipping nightmare cats paws and all of that kind of stuff and clawing and, and everything like that honestly um, so yeah just glassine paper is really really good uh, papers that I like I love pastel mat this is my favorite surface um, I know that we've been having a few sort of uh, uh, batch issues with pastel mat, but uh, pastel mat is my favourite and it should be beautifully velvety soft. You shouldn't be able to see um, a grain on it, bumps or anything. It should look smooth. Uh, pastel mat and drafting film are my favourite surfaces to work on. I absolutely love working on them. Um, Prismacolor pencils. Um, I don't mention them much. No, I don't. And I actually... <laughs> I absolutely love them. Um, I love them for drafting film um, human portraits. And that's why I, I bought a whole set of Prisma uh, for my drafting film portraits. And they're absolutely flipping fabulous. <laughs> they're just amazing. They're so soft. But I don't like Prisma on pastel mat because they're too soft again. I like the dry, hard pencils on pastel mat. So I think, you know... Um, if you love a kind of pencil, use it. I think it's really important. Um, you know, when you're when you're doing something like this, whether it's whether you're doing it as a job or you're doing it as a hobby or you're doing it as whatever, you need to love what you do. And that I think is what's kept me going. I mean, it's coming up to seven years, I think, that six years, seven years that I've been a full-time artist. And that's what's kept me going so that I'm excited about my drawing every single day is that I absolutely love using my pencils um, and I'm very careful about what I draw as well. Um, you know, 
So Prismas are great. They, they, they are great. If you love them, use them. Uh, I don't use a fixative at all. Um, I have had a bit of a play around with a with a gloss fixative, but I'm I'm not keen on it because of the chemically smell and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but I, I don't use a fixative on any of my portraits at all. Um, would I use a slice tool for whiskers on pastel mat? No, I would use um, I would use a sh very sharp. Let me show you. Very sharp Pablo. Um, I've actually got some little whiskers in. Oh, you can see that, yeah. Uh, so I would use a, a very very sharp Pablo to put my whiskers in here. That's that's how that's what I would do. I'd use my Pablo, and it and it works. If you've got enough layers in there. Um, it, you're going to be able to get your light, your white colour in over the top of the dark and it works really nicely. You can also use your uh, museum aquarelle. The problem, it, the problem is that when you start to put too much pressure on your white over the top of a dark colour, it goes like a milky grey colour and that's when it gets really frustrating. So you've got to make it, it needs to be sharper than this, you've got to make it really sharp and just sort of flick those uh, whiskers in. Um, uh, how would you clean a smudge? Can you salvage it? So there's a couple of things um, I've actually got. So I've got Scotch Magic Tape. This is this is the this would be the first thing that I would try. Um, just take a little piece of tape off. In fact, let me just put these down here. Oops. I'd take a little bit of tape off, and I'd take my take a pencil. So say I wanted to just move this, remove this little bit of a mark here and I'd go over the top. Be very careful that you don't go over onto the paper. And that's what I would use for this, first of all. I kind of just go over and over and over it. Try not to go too hard, but that's the scotch tape is what I would use first. If that didn't work and it was more of a smudge, um, we've been trialling this um, this little eraser here. I forgot, is it called a concrete eraser, cement eraser? It's to kind of erase sticky residue off surfaces. Um, and this is actually it's not a, it's not a rubber rubber, so it's not going to erase like pencil marks and stuff. But if you've got a mucky mark, um, it's actually not bad. Um, just try it up there. Yeah, it's worked up there. I've got a little mucky mark up at the top there. Don't know whether you. No, it's just out of camera, um, but it's quite for like a finger mark stain or something like that. It it works quite nicely. Sometimes you get mucky marks under. I've got magnets here. They 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 get a little bit mucky underneath them. Um, so it's um you know and this is just it feels it's really hard. It's like a like a weird. It's like a, a like a a three month old piece of cheese. <laughs> Um, try not to let my dogs get it because they'll probably eat it. Um, but those are the things that I would try first. If then you have a mark and it's not coming out, um, I'd then look at the crop of my of my portrait and I, can I crop it out? Uh, sometimes, sometimes you can't. Maybe you might have to put a little bit of a background in or something like that. Sometimes it's not that noticeable and actually, you know, you'd probably be able to get away with it. Um, I think rather than seeing a mark and going at it hammer and tongs, see the mark, sit back, have a plan of action, think about it, work out what you're going to do and then try to remove it. The worst thing you can do with a mark is go, oh heck I've got a mark, quite quick let's rub it out. You can make it a bit worse, um, you tend to go at it with a little bit of anger <laughs> <laughs> and you know so yeah you've got to be a little bit careful um and how do i decide so this would be the last question how do i decide to to um on a surface to choose i tend to work on the same surface that i've been working on most of my um uh portraits are done on pastel mat on pastel mat um some so i'll choose different papers for my tutorials because obviously i want to teach different things um on different surfaces um, but uh, you know you might have a favorite surface and you'll be able to do everything that you can do anything that you want to do you'll be able to do on a surface uh, it's just very much um, technique dependent so you'll need to swap your techniques around um, but I tend to like pastel mat for everything drafting film if there's lots of texture you know uh, if you've got lots and lots and lots of texture 
Uh, so I'm drawing my cat at the moment. She's got lots of texture, lots of like little tiny stray hairs and everything that I want to be able to capture. And then drafting film is wonderful for that because of course you've got the subtraction technique and everything. So I'm going to come back over to my screen and um, uh, come back onto my view um and just say thank you all so much for joining me i hope that was useful um you know i think it's really important to remember that it's a process uh, we all are going through a process and we've all got something to learn whether you've been drawing for a week or whether you've been in drawing for 30 years we've all got something to learn and i think that's a, a really important thing to, to to remember and to remind ourselves about um that it's a process that we should be enjoying the process um and if you're not enjoying the process what what can you do to 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 start enjoying it do you want do you need to use a different surface do you need to use um you know um different sorts of pencils do you need a little bit of help that you know but ultimately we should all be absolutely loving what we're doing so thank you all so much for joining me i've um i'm in my element here this is what i absolutely love to do um <laughs> i just i just like chatting and talking about color pencils it's, it's my favorite thing to do uh so thank you all so much for joining me um and um and I'll, I'll see you all very soon. I've got a live draw along next week. I think it's next Wednesday, I think, where we're drawing a robin. So hopefully you'll join me then and we're actually going to be drawing together. I'm going to be doing a step-by-step -step draw along. Uh, so hopefully you will, um, you know, you'll be able to join me there. But thank you all very, very much for joining me. Um, loved being here and um, have a lovely evening. Okay then, see you soon. Bye.